been there, done that. <laughs> um, if you have papers, pass them forward or to the middle or something, or if you want to start a bonfire, we can do that too. <laughs> I can't tell you the number of papers that I, you know, turned in with the holding my nose kind of a thing. If you have projects, <laughs> Pass those forward as well. Um, and I will, he sent me the electronic ones. Um, I'll return these projects. Thursday? Thank you. <laughs> you know, when I said last week that the semester's done for me, my brain is, it's, no, actually I stood up here to write this and I started to sway and I held onto the wall. <sighs> gonna be one of those days. I always, when I get papers, I read the titles to them. everybody. Was Sir Gowan a victim of manipulation? The reflection of Beowulf and the power of women. And there, then there are some paintings. Okay, so we are today doing Ben Johnson. Um, Today is the 18th, correct? Yes. <clears throat> so, three poems by Johnson that we're going to do, and eh, I might add one, depending on if we have time. Um, first one on my first daughter, the second one on my first son, and the third one, to the memory of my beloved, the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, in which we're going to discuss the Shakespeare authorship question which I think is a bunch of yes, but you know, it should be addressed anyways. So, um, make sure to read your introduction about Johnson. Johnson in his day, which is in Shakespeare's day and in John Donne's day, etc., cetera, um, he was hugely important. I mean, it's kind of hard to understand today because today he's not considered as hugely important in that period as, for example, was Shakespeare, or even done to that extent. Um, I'm trying to think how to put this nicely. It, he thought he was hugely important, okay? Johnson's the first writer to really suggest, and I don't remember, if, I see we like we have a copy somewhere in here, um, to really suggest that Writing was, in and of itself, work. It's done. Nope, it's not in here. Um, I'll post to D2L. A picture of the title page of Johnson's 1616 collected works, okay? Well, up until that point, because um, he kept writing. Much of what he wrote after that, nobody really pays much attention to today. But this, this title page, it's this massive edifice, like a building. And he has, you know, inscribed on, like, the front of it, the works of Benjamin Johnson. Um, nobody prior to Johnson considered writing work. It was always a hobby. In fact, that's going to be one of the things in the Shakespeare, Shakespeare authorship, look at that, authorship question is writing was something a person of means, a person of high status, did on the side, and it is suggested by many throughout the Renaissance that many men of means did it, and they also did it under another name. They wrote under a pseudonym, in other words. Why? Because they were so high standing, you didn't affix your name to things. There's some truth to that, but I could very easily prove the falsehood to that. Sir Philip Sidney, the greatest knight of his period, okay? 
who was a contemporary of Shakespeare, died in 1588, 1589. Um, when he died, all England mourned. Okay, so he, I mean, he was huge in stature. He put his name to Astrophil and Stella, the sonnet sequence that he wrote. He put his name to the defense of poesy, or an apology for poetry, the first defense of literature in the English language, part of a long tradition of defenses of literature and such. Um, Francis Bacon here put his name, but he was kind of a scientist too. You know, he was a sir, um, put his name to writing. He, Edward de Vere, did not. This is, Edward de Vere is one of the people put forward as the real author of all of Shakespeare's words, or at least all of Shakespeare's plays, okay? And we'll talk about that later. So Johnson considered what he did work. His father was a bricklayer, okay? I worked for a mason for about three months, um, done all kinds of manual labor in my life. I'm sure his father would say, Ben, that ain't work. Brick lane, now that's work. Mixing the mortar, slinging the mortar, moving bricks from one place to another, in this, you know, usually involving moving not one brick, but moving five or 10 bricks in a brick carrier, okay? So you're talking 40 or 50 pounds of brick in each arm and you're moving it, et cetera. That's work. Don't, don't tell me pulling out your quill and sharpening it, dipping it in an ink pot and doing this is work, so to speak, okay? But anyways, Johnson did. Johnson wrote a wide variety of stuff, a lot of poetry. He wrote a lot of plays. He wrote masks, which are highly ornate, stylized plays, big costumes, often with masks, literal, M-A-S-K-S, -S, on, some of them, et cetera. Um, those are hardly even read anymore, other than among PhDs or PhD wannabes trying to find dissertation topics, okay? So, on my first daughter, he's also a literary critic. There are conversations between Ben Johnson and a guy named William Drummond, who was a Scot, and Johnson took shots at his contemporaries. He said, for example, we're gonna read John Dunn after Johnson. He's gonna say, John Dunn for not keeping accent deserved hanging. And by not keeping accent means for not writing improper meter. Da da, you know, iambic pentameter. Da da, da da, da da, da da, da da. Dunn doesn't do that. Dunn takes meter and shoots it with a shotgun. He likes to play around with meter. He also says, in another conversation with Drummond, that Dunn, because of his naughty, K-N-O-T-T-Y, syntax would not be read outside this century, meaning outside the 17th century. And that, interestingly enough, was pretty accurate. After 1700 until 19, what, 21, 22, 23, somewhere around there, I don't remember the exact date of the article. Most people who read Dunn read Dunn for his sermons. They didn't read his poetry. His poetry was available. There were editions of it. 1920s, T.S. Eliot revived Dunn and the other one are called Metaphysical Poets in an essay titled The Metaphysical Poets. Okay? And from that day forward, Dunn was one of the most widely published on Poets of the Renaissance by English literary scholars. Because they're like, man, this guy is... You just keep unpacking his, this stuff. His poems are like onions, layer upon layer upon layer, okay? So he's right about that one, but the one about um, not keeping of accent, probably not right. On my first daughter, here lies to each her parents, Ruth, Mary, the daughter of their youth. Yet all heaven's gifts being heaven's due, it makes the father less to rue. 
At six months in, she parted hence with safety of her innocence, whose soul heaven's queen, whose name she bears, in comfort of her mother's tears, rhymed in, she, in Johnson's day, hath placed amongst her virgin train, where, while that severed doth remain, this grave partakes the fleshly birth, which cover lightly gentle earth. Now, I don't know, but you don't have a gloss that tells you, and I've never actually looked it up, I ought to, when his daughter died, that is, what year? Um, another little background comment. Johnson was Catholic. Okay. After James arrived in 1603, James the Fourth of Scotland, be, uh, James the Sixth of Scotland becomes James the First of England. After James arrived, the how do I want to put it? It's probably fair. The rabbit anti-Catholicism of the late of the late Elizabethan bleh, Elizabethan period kind of died down. James wasn't a rampant anti-Catholic or rabid anti-Catholic for the simple reason his mother was Catholic. Mary Queen of Scots, who was executed by Queen Elizabeth in the 1680s. 1687, I believe. Uh, because Mary, uh, not Mary, Elizabeth believed, probably rightly so, that Mary was somehow involved in the Catholic uprising in 1588 that was part of the Spanish Armadas sailing against England and such. Okay. James was a Protestant. He fancied himself a theologian. Well, he fancied himself a lot of things. Fancied himself a theologian. He wrote a book on devils and demons. I think it's called Demonology. Shakespeare kind of tips his hat to him with the play that is never named by actors, especially if they're putting on the play, Macbeth, okay, which has witches and demons kind of alluded to. That's, you know, his way of um, sucking up to the king. Is this the James from the King James Bible? Yes, king yes. King James commissioned the Bible, 1607, 1608, took about three years for three different committees of people, one at Westminster, one at Oxford, one at Cambridge, if I remember correctly, to come up with the translation. And by the way, that translation is intentionally archaic at the time it's published. People, generally speaking, on the street, at the store, et cetera, in the pubs, they didn't use thou and thee and hast and half and Thine, they were using you, your, my, okay? The, the TH forms are definitely about minimum 50 years or so out of date. And that's because James kind of instructed them and the, the scholars involved wanted the language not to be everyday English. They wanted it to be intentionally elevated. Just like when Keats and Shelley write their odes, they're using intentionally elevated language, right? So, you know, Christians today who think, you know, King James, that's the language I've used, they don't understand that even at the time, that wasn't what everybody naturally spoke, okay? And you'll see, if you take a course in Shakespeare, hopefully it's pointed out, You'll see, Shakespeare plays around, for example, with those pronoun usages. The Y forms, you, your, and the TH forms, the, thou. In Hamlet, there's a wonderful scene with Hamlet and his mother. And they go back and forth between using those because the TH form is the personal, the, the close, the familiar form, and the Y forms are the distanced, okay? the unfamiliar, the indicating a break in social status and a break in age forms. We think just the other way around. That referring to God as thou is saying there's this gap between us. In 
James's day and earlier, that indicates the familiarity. Okay, so Hamlet and his mother start to talk, and she says some things, and Hamlet turns, changes the pronoun usage to indicate there is a distance between them. It's also the distance is also moral, <laughs> where you can use it to indicate your moral superiority over the other person. Anyways, back to Johnson. How old is his daughter when she dies? Six months. Okay. Here lies to each your parents, Ruth. We don't use the word Ruth alone as a standalone word any longer in the, Ameri in the English language. I can't think of any instance in today or in the last, I don't know, 40 or 50 years where it's used. It's always used with what suffix? Less. Ruthless. If someone's a ruthless killer, what kind of killer are they? Because that's usually the kind of context it's using. You don't say I'm a ruthless consumer or eater. You know, you can be, I guess. So what's ruthless? Without remorse, without pity, without mercy. Okay. So. Yeah. Do you use that daily? Not regularly? It is, but it, again, that's not, that's very seldom used in modern English, okay? And it is going to be used a couple lines later. So to each your parents, Ruth. So without the less, what's it mean by itself? Pity. If ruthless is pitiless, Ruth is pity. If ruthless is merciless to their mercy, to their sorrow, okay? Marry the daughter of their youth. Kind of implying she was born early in their marriage. I don't know if his and his wife's marriage was like Shakespeare and Anne's marriage, you know, shotgun or not. But all heaven's gifts being heaven's due, it makes the father less to rue. Why are heaven's gifts due to heaven? Okay. Job says, Blessed be the name of the Lord. When he finds out his ten kids have been slaughtered. Okay. Notice that's also a hearkening back. I don't, I'm not indicating or not suggesting Johnson had any knowledge of old English poetry. But it's, it echoes that idea that we saw in the old English. That all of this life is what? Loaned. We have it on loan. It's got to be paid back, therefore. It makes the Father. So, yet all heaven's gifts being heaven's due, it makes the Father less to rue, to be sorrowful over. Why? What does that line indicate? What do those two lines indicate in terms of Johnson's theology? Where's his daughter? In heaven. Just reading an article yesterday by some Catholic, I think it's by a Catholic priest, who talks about, you know, um, Pope Benedict did away with limbo in the Catholic belief system. He goes on to state it was never limbo, the place, was never actually part of Catholic doctrine. Okay? Limbo is a place outside of the place of the dead, where people who had never heard about Christianity and babies who hadn't been baptized went to upon their deaths. Okay? And apparently the idea developed that it was a place of natural happiness, not theological happiness. Not the experience of joy with God, but the experience of kind of, I don't understand this, natural joy, I guess, looking out on a beautiful sunny day and seeing flowers and such, okay? <clears throat> it develops in the later Middle Ages 
And it develops because, you know, as we talked about before, so I won't go into it a lot. Because of St. Augustine saying, a baby that, is, that dies without being baptized goes to hell. But not hell, the place of burning and torture, but Dante's limbo just outside hell proper, where everybody just sits around and sighs. You know, it's boring for all eternity. Well, apparently Pope Benedict, before he resigned, relegated the notion of uh, limbo to merely a hypothetical idea. Whereas before then, it had been taught, but not taught as a doctrine or dogma of the faith. That is, as something that you must believe in in order to be saved. Okay, So, back to Johnson. All gifts being due to heaven, it makes the Father less to rue. He feels comforted knowing his daughter is in heaven. And being Catholic, his daughter would have been baptized very soon. You know, Shakespeare's baptismal certificate is April 26th, 1564. It's on the basis of that that scholars assume he was probably born around, if not on, April 23rd. That means that, according, I haven't looked into baptismal practice in Shakespeare's day, that baptisms probably occurred within three days of birth, okay? At six months in, she parted hence with safety of her innocence. And I think the safety of her innocence is implying two things. One, probably baptized, and therefore innocent, clean, because baptism washes away sins. And two, how much sin can a six-month-old do? That, by the way, is one of the reasons for Benedict pushing limbo aside. Because when he pushed limbo aside, essentially said, unbaptized children no longer go to hell. They enter immediately with God. Okay? So, what, what do you have to do in order to sin? Or what must you be in order to sin? You have to be able to know what sin is. You have to, good and evil. You have to be able to def- Determine, you've got to be able at the very least to choose. The six month old cannot choose. It just is. Okay? Whose soul, heaven's queen, whose name she bears, that's a little indication of his Catholicism. Protestants don't refer to Mary as heaven's queen. Okay? There's a Latin phrase, salve regina. Queen of Salvation. Okay. Whose soul heaven's queen, whose name she bears, in comfort of her mother's tears. Notice the speaker isn't saying anything about his own tears, but you know, the mother naturally cries. Hath placed amongst her virgin train. That is, little Mary is now following. The Blessed Virgin Mary and her, and notice the train imagery. How is train being used here? Any of you ever seen the Rodgers and Hammerstein Sound of Music? When Julie Andrews' character gets married, Maria von Trapp becomes Maria von Trapp. Remember that scene in the cathedral? What is she wearing, first of all? A wedding dress with a Really, it's called a train. It's like, if I remember right, that dress, the train on that dress in the middle is something like 26 feet long. I mean, it was hugely expensive when they made it. She's in that kind of train. All the virgins who died in faith are placed there. Dante <laughs> portrays that beautifully in the Divine Comedy and the Third book to Paradiso. Okay. Where, so she's been placed in the virgin train, where, while that severed doth remain, this grave partakes the fleshly birth. 
Her soul, severed from the body, remains in heaven. Okay? And what does the grave get? So the, the, the spiritual birth stays in heaven. The soul, uh, the body, stays down here. Which cover lightly, gentle earth. That line always gets me. Because what's he saying? What happens to graves? All of them. Especially in Shakespeare's day, more so than today, where you have caskets, and then the caskets are put inside concrete bunkers in some jurisdictions, some city states, etc. Require the wooden casket to go inside like a concrete shell. And it's so that it can't be, it won't leach out stuff to the water table. They didn't have that in Shakespeare's day. Graves, go to an old graveyard. And sometimes you'll see, you know, the ground is just slightly sunken where the graves are. Why? Because that wood rots and the pressure of the earth compresses. So you now have a hollow. Read Emily Dickinson's Because I Could Not Stop for Death. Because there's a line there that talks about what once had been mounded over when you bury someone, you put more, you put the dirt all on top, and because there's now a big box in the hole, it's taking up space, the dirt doesn't go flat. So you mound it over, after the box rots, caves in, it settles, and you get that imagery in that poem by Dickinson. But what's he saying with that last line? Don't squeeze her. Even though the speaker knows little Mary isn't there anymore. She's not at home. She's in heaven. He's saying, be gentle to the body. Why? Okay. Why else? Why did it used to be against pretty much all Christian belief systems? Um, I can't think of the word. Not right. Not allowed to practice cremation. Because they thought that the body is what's going to resurrect. The body is going to resurrect, and because the body in and of itself is sacred. The body is sacred. That's why you don't desecrate bodies in wars. Desecration of a corpse is considered, one, that's against the law, <laughs> even in civil society, okay? But desecration of an enemy combatant is also against the Geneva Conventions, okay? Next one, on my first son. Oh, the sinuses are going crazy today. <clears throat> so on my first daughter, on my first son, man, Sucks to be Ben Johnson. Farewell, thou child of my right hand and joy. My sin was too much hope of thee, loved boy. Why doesn't he just say, farewell, Benjamin? Benjamin means child of my right hand. Okay? Two of, got to get the right ones, Jacob's. Children, um, <coughs> were, I'm getting the biblical metaphor, mixed, uh, the biblical story mixed up, were by the one wife that he really, really loved. Benjamin was one, and Joseph, I believe, was the other. And the other ten were from um, Leah or one of the concubines, okay? <coughs> I think might be confusing him with Abraham. Um, preacher Leah, Ra Rachel and Leah. Joseph and Benjamin were from Rachel, and the other ten were from Leah. Thou child of my right hand. What's significant about the right hand? It's not <laughs> okay, it's not the sinister hand, the left hand. All the biblical metaphors used throughout the Old Testament, for example. When God does something, when God acts, if it's described, the action is described anthropomorphically, it's how. 
He raised out his right hand. He strikes with his right hand. He does something to the right hand of glory. When Jesus ascends and sits in heaven, where does he sit? On the right hand of God. All of that. Okay. So the right hand is powerful. It's majestic. It's a... What's he saying? You are going to be my heir. You are going to be my everything. By naming him Benjamin. Plus, again, there's also that little narcissistic element. Naming him after himself. Okay. Um, Farewell, thou child of my right hand and joy. So it's not just the child of the right hand, power, all that. Child of my joy. My sin was too much hope of thee, loved boy. What sin? I don't mean the rest of the line. Why does he why does he introduce sin right there? What's Johnson implying? And here, by the way, you know, the other day I, I think it was the other day, it might be confusing with my Lord of Intercourses. I think I said, you know, at some point, never assume the author is the speaker of a poem. With these two, it is. <laughs> this is Ben Johnson speaking. This is not, you know, some impersonal made up persona. Okay? He's implying the child died because of his sin. Something he did. Could be. So, what was the sin? Too much hope of you. Where is a Christian's hope supposed to reside? <laughs> it's not down here. Why? Okay, all this is temporary. Why else? I've been married to my wife for nearly 38 years. I know her pretty well. She knows me pretty well. One thing we both know about each other is we're both at one point or another going to screw up. The idol that we create of that other, you know, the Jerry Maguire stupid line, you complete me. No, no, because that completion is going to crack. That image, that little porcelain doll is going to fall. And then we got to put Humpty Dumpty, you know, back together. My hope, my <laughs> sin was too much hope of thee. Extrapolate to today. How do parents put, show, too much hope in a child? Does, have none of you ever experienced Usually I've got students going. I've never heard that phrase. Oh, you know, like, I mean, like, if, if you have, like, a really pretty kid or a really funny kid, moms will take a bunch of videos and post them online, and, like, they get money out of social media for their kids having their own, like, Instagram pages. What well, used to be moms wanted their kids to become actors. Now you don't even have to do anything. You just be cute. Yeah. Okay? Wow. <laughs> never knew that. Okay, there's something I like Hamlet need to wipe from my brain if I can get a big enough magnet. Okay, yes, probably. What else do parents sometimes do? They look at their children and what do they kind of? Vicarious living. Johnson turned his back metaphorically. I'm not saying he did this literally. On his father's life. Why? Dad was what? A bricklayer. A bricklayer. Johnson was an intellectual. <laughs> I should close the door and stop recording. I can tell stories, but I won't. <laughs> of English professors, you know, and such. Seven years thou wert lent to me, and I thee pay. Lent, pay, we're back in Old English, right? This is the language of loans, of transitoriness. Seven years thou wert lent to me, and I thee pay, exacted by thy fate on the just day. Exacted. Atropo, Greek goddess, one of the fates, 
has decided it's time to snip your thread of life. Why? Because it's the just day. Just meaning not, oh, it's just the day. It's the just day. It's the right, the appropriate, the fitting, the meet, the proper. In other words, Johnson, Ben, didn't know it at the time, but when his child was born, he was given, spiritually so to speak, a promissory note. And the promissory note said, on whatever day this was, I agree to pay back to you, God, little Ben. That's why it's the just day. Oh, could I lose all father now? Not a question. It's an exclamation. It reads better, or let me rephrase that. It's easier to read as a question, but it's not a question. What does he mean by exclamation, by exclamating it? Okay, possibly. Anybody remember, if you've read the book of Job, one of the things that Job says that kind of displeases God, it would be better had I never been born. God's like, who the hell do you think you are? You know, and just starts rattling off stuff. I think, I could be wrong in this interpretation. I think Johnson's saying, I would have been better off if I'd never had a son. Johnson's saying, no, it is not better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. I've never miscarriage. My wife had a miscarriage between our second and third child, children. But I've never had a live child die. Ex-friends, I won't go into that story, who had their first two children die as babies. I can't imagine wanting to try to have another child after having two die. Johnson's kind of... No, don't, don't tell me, oh, but you had those seven years with them. Because I think that wound is pretty raw. Could I lose all father now? For why will man, and then he immediately catches himself. For why will man lament the state he should envy? Why should I lament, mourn over, having been a father, but am not now. <laughs> Does one stop being a father if one's child dies? Does a woman stop being a mother if her child? Mm, I don't think so. I think that that sense goes on. It's just Johnny isn't here anymore, or Benny isn't here anymore. Okay. What's he saying? What state should a man envy? done a lot of things in my life, got all kinds of degrees, it doesn't amount to squat to having the first, in our case four, and then the second, and the third, and then children. Of course, then they grow up and then they, you know, become little brats and all that other stuff. Why will man lament the state he should envy? See that, I wish I wasn't a father, and then he immediately catches himself. What are you talking about, Ben? To have so soon escaped worlds and flesh's rage, and if no other misery, yet age. Now, what do those two lines just do to the way I interpreted? Will man lament the state he should envy? 
See, I was suggesting the state was being a father, the state of fatherhood. But those next two lines imply what? That's not the state he's talking about. The state or condition is what? Talk to anybody today. What's the one thing most people fear the most? Death. Which Socrates, by the way, said, why? I don't get it, guys. Why do you fear death? You don't know what death is. Generally, we fear things we know. Like someone coming at you with a gun or a knife. Why? Because you know what's going to happen. You don't fear the unknown. Not a person in this room knew what today is going to be like. We still don't know what the rest of the day is going to be like. And yet we still get up. We get out of bed. We think we know what the day is going to be like. Why? Because we lived yesterday and the day before and the day before and all the days of our lives. Does that mean today is going to be any different? Not necessarily. And yet three weeks ago, Six people woke up, and they didn't go to sleep. Their days turned out radically different than every other day of their lives for both the nine-year-olds and the 60-year-olds at the school in Nashville. The state we should envy, he's suggesting, is what? Death. Why? Because in death you escaped. The world's and flesh's rage. Get on CNN. Get on headline news. Get on any news channel. And what do we see around us? Nothing. Thank you. <laughs> it's like the world's going to hell. That's the world's rage. My wife and I were talking the other night. We're Orthodox, so our Easter was... Saturday night, Sunday. Service was late Saturday night into Sunday. And we were driving home thinking, how in the world can the Ukrainians and the Russians celebrate Pascha when they're at each other's throats, you know, or Easter? The next thing, so that's the world's rage. What about the flesh's rage? What's he mean by rage? Is this just simply the unbridled passions? Could be. What else could it be? Heather's over there yawning because she's tired. Okay. What is that? That's an example of the body saying, I need more rest. I need more sleep. I wake up every morning. You know, it's like, because oh, I kind of have to push myself because my knees. That's the flesh's rage. It's like it's fighting against what? Whatever the thing is inside, whatever you want to call it. Soul, spirit, mind, consciousness, etc. And if no other misery, that is, maybe your flesh is fine, maybe the world's fine, what about age? The gradual wearing down. Rest in soft. Why? Oh, you're free. <laughs> like the old Negro spiritual. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty. Free at last. Free from what? Slavery? Yes. Slavery, physical, earthly slavery within the Christian tradition is what? It's symbolic of spiritual slavery. Which is why people interpret the whole thing about... Egypt, the Hebrews coming out of Egypt, that's leaving bondage to freedom. Crossing over Jordan is entering the promise. Rest in soft peace. You don't have to go through what the rest of us have had to go through. Was it this class where I made the comment the other day about you couldn't, or was it my one of my lit courses? You couldn't pay me enough to go back to being your ages. Nope. Wouldn't want to ever, literally, you could not pay me. 
to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that come in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, etc. Maybe have my body back the same? Yes, but not forever. Rest in soft peace and ask. Say here to fly, Ben Johnson is best piece of poetry. Love that line. Because Johnson, it's not quite punny. Maybe it is. But he's playing on that word poetry. What is a poem? Which of those is the correct spelling? Might be that. That's a P, by the way. P O E S I S. Poem comes from the Greek poesis. Okay? What is it? What's a poem? We all think we know what a poem is, right? Poem has to have one. Have to have meter? Not necessarily. Often do. But what is a poem? Literally, poesis means to make. To create. A poem is something made of words. So you can have all kinds of different poetry. You can have lyric poetry. You can have epic poetry. There are different muses for each of those, there's the epic poet muse, the lyric poet muse. Okay? Nine muses in the Greek system. Anne Bradstreet, first American poet, was labeled by her brother-in-law the tenth muse because of her poetry. All right? So a poem is simply something made. We accept as a convention it is something made out of words. So poetry is something made out of words. But look what Johnson does here. And this is what I think is just beautiful. Here lies my best piece of poetry. And that might refer to here, this poem, or it might refer to here in the grave. Here's the best thing I ever made. Ben Johnson is best piece of poetry, for whose sake henceforth, that is, for Ben Johnson's sake, all his vows be such. Is it Ben Johnson's sake? Who's the his referred to? For whose sake henceforth, all his vows be such, as what he loves, oh, come on eyes, may never like too much. From this point on, my vow is, whatever I love, I'm not going to like too much. What's the... Oh, so we remove from it, you won't get hurt by it. So, is it better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all? Johnson is saying, what about love and like? They're not the same. Like is implying here almost the opposite of what we mean today. That, that we mean like is not as powerful as love. Johnson's implying, no. I can love something, but I'm not going to like it too much, meaning I'm going to keep some distance between us. I love you, but I'm not going to let you in, so to speak. Why? What happens to everyone we love? They die. It's Shakespeare's, the time of year thou mayst in me behold, when forty winters shall besiege thy brow. Okay? It's Shakespeare's, um, why am I drawing a blank?
No, wrong one. The time of year that makes the meat behold when yellow leaves are none or few do hang. Why? Because you love that much which you must soon leave or lose. Okay? So you're pulling away. You're in that sonnet, the speaker is suggesting you're distancing the other person, distancing yourself from me. Why? To make it easier for that final break. What sometimes happens when people have a loved one get ill. We like to think, oh, that's when you show up more, you get even closer. Sadly, what often happens is you don't show up as much. Yep, my mother-in-law is in assisted living because she insisted when we moved her up here, I'm not going to live in your house. I am not going to break up your family dynamic. When my dad died and when my mom died, they both stayed at home and we, the five kids, found ways to take care of them. When my dad died, we are like, he's going to stay there. My sister and brother lived nearby. And the rest of us, we came. I came three times in that fall to try to be there, do whatever. But the promise was, we're not going to put you in a convalescent home. If my, grand, if my mother-in-law gets too much worse, the assisted living facility may say, we, we can't provide her care here. And when it comes down to the last week or two, we'll move her home. And we'll just do round the clock, hospice care, but we'll be there so that when she takes that last breath, someone will be there, okay? It doesn't make it easier, it doesn't make it, you know, nicer, so to speak. As what he loves much may never like too much. Interestingly, John Donne writes a holy sonnet on the death of his wife. Actually, he writes three that have to do with the death of his wife. And in one of them, he's kind of like, what are you doing, God? Okay. C.S. Lewis does the exact same thing in his little book titled A Grief Observed not W with the name N.W. Clerk affixed to it. He wrote it under a pseudonym. And in A Grief Observed Lewis, you know this this great defender of the faith, this great apologist, all that kind of stuff, he rails, just rails, on the death of his wife, who only, he'd only been married to for four years. He was like, I was a happy bachelor. Happy. I had my books, I had my beer, I had my pipes, and my cigarettes, I had my friends, and then you introduce this woman to me, and she turns everything upside down. And then you go and take her away from me. What kind of cruel monster are you? He describes God as a vivisector. You know what vivisection is? Dissecting. He's like, you cut me open. But he moves through. Notice, it's a grief observed. It's one of the most powerful things Lewis ever wrote. Okay? Johnson is observing this grief. All right? Go from there to, to the memory of my beloved, the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, and what he hath left us. This is published in the first folio of Shakespeare's play, 1623. It is one of several prefatory poems dedicated to about Shakespeare, so to speak. Um, And it praises. I mean, you can't get any higher praise than what Johnson gives here. Okay? To draw no envy, Shakespeare, on thy name, am I thus ample to thy book and fame? While I confess thy writings to be such as neither man nor muse can praise too much. Neither man nor a god of writing any of the muses can praise your works too much. 
Now, Harold Bloom, famous English, uh, literary critic, wrote a book called Shakespeare the, and he essentially says, Shakespeare is the focal point of all Western culture. Everything before Shakespeare points to him, and everything after Shakespeare refers back to him. That pretty much anybody who writes anything today, they're just kind of footnoting Shakespeare. Okay? <clears throat> Tis true. In other words, what I just said is true in all men's suffrage. Everyone agrees with what I said. But these ways were not the paths I meant unto thy praise. In other words, shoot, I got off track. <laughs> so let me refocus, let me get back on track. Why? For silliest that is foolish. Ignorance on these may light. Even a stupid person can say what I just said. Which, when it sounds at best, but echoes right. Or blind affection, which doth ne'er advance the truth, but gropes and urges all by chance. Or crafty malice might pretend this praise, and think to ruin where it seemed to raise. These are our, some infamous bod or whore should praise a matron. What could hurt her more? An infamous bod or whore, you know. Uh, pick your, I don't know, I shouldn't go there. No, I'm not even going to go there. But thou art proof against them, and indeed above the ill fortune of them or the need. So the first 16 lines are Johnson's preface to what he's really going to say. And the first 16 lines are all about the kinds of people who can and have praised Shakespeare, or who will Shakespeare. You might be at a party with something, and you talk about, you know, oh, I saw Hamlet, or I saw some play, and somebody, oh, I love Shakespeare. And you start talking to them, and what do you find out? They've never read. They've never seen any Shakespeare. But they want to be acknowledged as somehow educated, culturally elite. So Johnson gets to the real epitaph, or the real praise. I therefore will begin. Soul of the age. So, here's the Earth. Here's something orbiting around it. Let me rephrase that. So let's assume this isn't the Earth, but this is a body, and this is the thing orbiting around it. Part of the medieval philosophy of the cosmos goes back to Greece, ancient Greece, was what's called the Ptolemaic system, where you do have the Earth, and it's surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine concentric spheres, right? Outside the last sphere, out here, is God. God is stable. God is um, unmoving. But God causes the movement of the spheres. The movement of these affects us down here. How do you know? Pick up a copy of the Daily News Journal or the Tennessean and find the horoscope page. That's how you know. Astrology. Okay? Astrology says, if you're born under Mars and something else is happening, that's going to mean you're more martial life. If it's Venus, you're more, etc. Okay? Part and parcel of this ideology, let's say, in the Middle Ages, it gets Christianized. So that each of these spheres that revolves has a, what's called, ruling intelligence. Okay? Our world has a ruling intelligence too. An angel in charge of it. This part of the idea goes back to the Old Testament where you have in the book of Daniel a conversation and there's a discussion of these wars going on. And the wars are both physical down here. There are people at war. But simultaneously there are angelic beings at war. And the prince of Persia, I think it's described, it's not a physical prince. It's the angel guarding Persia is warring against, or whatever the word is, somebody else, okay? Similarly, New Testament, Paul refers to the prince of the power of the air. Who's that? Satan. 
Satan is this. C.S. Lewis pulls on that idea in his space trilogy. I'm not giving all this to talk about Satan. Did he just say Lewis has a space trilogy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Out of the Silent Planet, Paralandra, and that hideous strain. And that, I just reread them again in January. And that hideous strain, it is so prophetic <laughs> to describe today. So, you have this sphere, and the sphere has a ruling intelligence. Okay? Soul of the age. This is the age. Shakespeare is the soul. He's the guiding intelligence. He's the ruling power. Johnson is saying. Notice, not Elizabeth, not James, Shakespeare. Soul of the age, the applause, delight, the wonder of our stage. My Shakespeare, rise, come out of the ground. I will not lodge thee by Chaucer or Spencer or bid Beaumont lie a little further to make thee a room. He's talking about Poet's Corner in Westminster Abbey. It was already a thing when Shakespeare died. Chaucer has a monument in Poet's Corner. So did Beaumont and Fletcher. Beaumont and Fletcher were authors Shakespeare helped after he retired from London. My two noble kinsmen, by one or both of them, Shakespeare helped, okay? I think it's my two noble kinsmen. So he's saying, I'm not gonna ask them, as Hagrid would say, to budge over so that we can fit you in here. Go to Poet's Corner today, and it's packed. Just packed. Everything's covered. You can't walk without stepping on somebody's marker and or grave. So he says, I won't ask them to move to make thee a room. Why? Thou art a monument without a tomb. Now who's the thou? Shakespeare, right? Because that's who's being addressed. But what else? How's he using Shakespeare metonymically, metonymically? Whatever, however you want to pronounce that word. His works. Your works are a monument. Okay? I mean, go back and look at, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? As long as uh, men have breath to breathe and eyes to see, so long as this and this is life to thee. And art alive still while thy book doth live. As long as we have Shakespeare in book form, and he'll still live. And we have wits to read and praise to give. So we have to have the book. We have to have wits to read, the ability to read. And we have to have praise to to give. And I think what Johnson is saying there is we have to have wits enough to realize this is worth praising. Okay? That I not mix thee so, my brain excuses. Not mix them. With, with what? I mean with great. But disproportion muses. I'm not going to include you with other muses, okay? For if I thought my judgment were of years, notice not soul of an age, you know, you, 1585, 1590 to 1612, not just that time period. If I thought my judgment were of years, I should commit thee surely with thy peers. And so what does he do? He mentions some of the people writing at the same time as Shakespeare. And tell how far thou didst our Lily, John Lily, outshine, or sporting kid, Thomas Kidd, Spanish tragedy, or Marlowe's mighty line, Dr. Faustus, Tamburlaine, Hero and Leander, etc. The most famous line from Johnson, and though thou hadst small Latin and less Greek, from thence to honor thee I would not seek for names, but call forth thundering Aeschylus, Euripides and Sophocles. So, 
hold off on the small Latin and less Greek. Notice he says, I wouldn't seek to find names from ancient Greece. Seek meanings what? I wouldn't have to get on Google and go, famous playwrights from ancient Greece. Who does he immediately think of? The three greatest. Aeschylus, author of the Oresteia, Euripides, the author of what, Medea and a bunch of others, and then Sophocles, the Oedipus cycle. Pacuvius, Achaeus, him of Cordova dead, to life again, to hear thy buskin tread, and shake a stage, or when thy socks were on, the buskin and socks, two different kinds of pennants, flags, that would fly outside the theater. The buskin is a mask that indicates this is a tragedy, or a flag that has a mask on it that indicates a tragedy. It's usually the one, you know, big eyes and a frown. The sock is one that indicates a comedy. So the authors that he mentioned above, all tragedians, okay? Uh, I lost my place. Or when thy socks were on, leave thee alone for the comparison of all the insolent Greece or haughty Rome sent forth. Or since did from their ashes come, triumph my Britain. Thou hast one to show to whom all scenes of Europe homage show. He has just said, Shakespeare is the greatest of them all. Every other author, kind of in their writing, pays homage to Shakespeare. Maybe not literally, but maybe like Shakespeare shows in Sonnet 98, where he talks about You've been away during my winter, and therefore I haven't had your lily with me. But, oh, look, there are nasturtiums and pansies and forget-me-nots and all these other flowers. And yet seemed it winter still, and you away, as with your shadow I with these did play. All these other scenes of Europe are essentially shadows of what Shakespeare did. Triumph, my Britain, thou hast one to show to whom all scenes of Europe homage owe. He was not of an age, but for all time. Okay? Let me back up because I skipped the small Latin, less Greek. What does it mean, and though thou had small Latin and less Greek? No, though the upper class who had been educated, not all the upper class were educated, the upper class who had been educated will, would know Latin and Greek because they would have gotten it in their schooling. Shakespeare, by the way, if he attended the King Edward VI school, which almost everybody assumes he did, okay, even though he's not listed in any of the roles, we do know the roles are incomplete. But the very fact that his father had been mayor of, of Stratford-on-Avon, and before that had been an alderman, that's pretty, you know, high, relatively high-status individual. His son would have gone to school there, all right? So what does that mean? I think I've alluded here or said it in here before, that by the time Shakespeare would have left that grammar school, at the, around the age of 11 or 12, he would have had the equivalent today Latin and Greek education, understanding, reading of somebody who graduates from Sewanee with a classics major. I have to use Sewanee because MTSU doesn't have a classics major. You can take courses in Greek and Latin, but you can't major in classics. You can at Sewanee. So you would start freshman year. If you had already had Greek and Latin in high school, you would start with introductory Greek and probably simultaneously introductory Latin. And by the time you would finish 
that four years, you would be reading Caesar in the original. You'd be reading Cicero, uh, Sallust, Seneca, etc. You'd be reading Sophocles, Aeschylus, Aristotle, Plato, all in original Greek. Okay? Shakespeare would have had probably the equivalent of that by the age of 11 or 12. He would have begun learning only English, but they would have begun introducing Latin and Greek around the ages of seven and eight. He would have begun at around the age six. Okay? Um, J.R.R. Tolkien, who lived you know, several hundred years after Shakespeare, he knew Greek by the time he was eight. He was being taught it by a tutor. In the, the way the Latin would have been taught, once they reach sufficient proficiency, they'd be given a text, for example, a passage from Caesar's Gallic Wars. They'd be given that text, and then they'd have their slate. And they'd have to translate that passage into English. And the teacher would look at it and see if it was okay, and if it wasn't, make corrections and such. Then the Caesar passage would be taken away, so they only had the English one that they had translated. And then they would go from that back to Caesar's Latin. And it had to match perfectly. And if it didn't, this was in the good old days, you get the ruler wrapped across the knuckles. Pretty good method to instill you know, perfection. I'm being facetious, obviously. Okay? That's why by the age of 11 or 12, he would have had, comparatively today, really good Latin and Greek. So why did Johnson say he had small Latin and less Greek? <coughs> Again, most scholars say Johnson is saying, compared to me, Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson was a classicist. He, he was a master of Latin and Greek. And Johnson saying, Compared to me, you have small Latin and even less Greek. All right? Pause for a second. This small Latin and less Greek is one of the reasons that many people have suggested William Shakespeare, Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon was not the author of the plays attributed to William Shakespeare of Stratford-on-Avon because they assume Someone with little Latin, small Latin, and less Greek could not have written these plays. Okay? Another reason. The first folio isn't published until 1623. Shakespeare died in 1660. Why seven years? Why did it take seven years to come out with a collected edition or complete edition of Shakespeare's plays? Were they trying to find copies? No, we know that there were copies of the plays floating around and such. So one of the arguments is based on an absence of information. Why seven years? Other poets, much, much lesser poets, when they died, there was a book of commendatory verse published within a year of their deaths. There's a guy named Edward King, dies in 1630. I think it's 1630. Nobody reads them today. Nobody. My dissertation professor wrote an entry for him in the Dictionary of Literary Biography, I believe it was. Uh, and so he did all this research. And you got all these people. I mean, it's a book about, I don't know, 80, 100 pages maybe, writing, you know, oh, he's the greatest poet who ever lived, blah, 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 blah. And he's not. So why the silence about Shakespeare? Argument is because William Shakespeare Stratford was not the one who wrote the poems and plays, and because the guy it suggested who did write them was still alive. It's one of the ideas, right? So if Shakespeare didn't write the plays, who did? Several names have been proposed. I'll give you the two major ones: Francis Bacon, the essayist; okay, Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford. And for both of these, who do you think are the people who propose Bacon and De Vere as the real authors are? 
descendants of Francis Bacon and descendants of Edward de Vere and the Earl of Oxford. They're the ones who primarily argue this. George Bernard Shaw was an anti Stratfordian, not a slouch intellectually, one of the greatest playwrights in contemporary or modern uh, playwriting. Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes, I'm pretty sure Oliver Wendell Holmes, one of the most famous Supreme Court justices who was wrong on a hell of a lot of stuff. Mark Rylance. I don't know if you know who Mark Rylance is. He won an Oscar a couple years ago for a film with um, Tom Hanks. He was in The Master of Wolf Hall or Wolf Hall, uh, Netflix or Amazon uh, series. He was the first artistic director of the new Shakespeare's Globe from 95 to 2005. Saw him in probably, I don't know, at least 10 or 15 plays, Shakespeare plays at the Globe. He is, if not the best, one of the best actors alive today. I, I can't, he's definitely one of the best interpreters of Shakespeare in terms of acting and directing. Globe, the Globe, in my opinion, the Globe has gone downhill in terms of its productions because now it is entirely consumed, in my opinion, with sex jokes. It makes everything to be about sex. It's disgusting. Um, you can find his stuff on, I mean, you can find some of the Globe plays with Mark Ryan's online. His big book, literally, it's like this tall, this wide, about this thick, called Play. It's about his 10 years as artistic director. Opens with a comment about Shakespeare not being Shakespeare, about Shakespeare not being the author of the plays. Another cause for Shakespeare not being the author, didn't attend university. It is thought only someone who attended university had the education and knowledge to be able to write the plays that we have. Okay. No indication Shakespeare knew French, one of his sources. I think for both Hamlet and Midsummer Night's Dream, only available in French, had not been translated into English. Okay. Several things like that. So, what's the proof that Shakespeare is Shakespeare? Well, one, there's the name, Shakespeare, which is on the title page of the first folio, the name is on the pages, the titles of some of my, many of the quartos, if not all of them. There are references to Shakespeare's plays beginning in 1592 with Thomas Green. There are references to Shakespeare as the author of the plays in journals kept in the 1590s. For example, the acting troupe that the Lord Chamberlain's men's that was the Lord Chamberlain's men, Shakespeare's group, biggest competitor called the Admiral's men, run by, managed by a guy named Philip Henslow. If you saw Shakespeare in Love, Jeffrey Rush played Philip Henslow. This guy kept a running diary of all the plays going on in London because he would go to them. And we think he probably sent spies actors to go to watch some of these plays and copy them. No plagiarism, no copyright, you know, okay? He talks about Shakespeare. He talks about Shakespeare's plays. There's numerous references, okay? What else? There's, there are linguistic proofs. In other words, Shakespeare's plays are full of a bunch of Warwick-isms, dialectal varieties only found in Warwickshire. In Stratford is in the middle of Warwickshire, okay? So, back to Johnson. So he goes on. Um, Triumph by Britain, etc. He was not of age but for all time, and all the muses still were in their prime. When, like Apollo, he came forth to warm our ears, or like a mercury to charm. Nature herself was proud of his designs. In other words, Shakespeare so portrayed the natural world 
Then nature kind of went, way to go. This is good stuff. And joy to wear the dressing of his lines, which were so richly spun and woven so fit, as since she will vouchsafe no other wit. Meaning nature doesn't favor any other authors. Now, well, who's included in the any other authors? Ben Johnson. The Merry Greek, Tart Aristophanes, writer of some rip-roaring hilarious comedies. Neat Terence, Winnie Plautus. We don't like those authors anymore, now not please, but antiquated and deserted lie as they were not of nature's family. Yet must I not give nature all, meaning you weren't born only with this gift. Now, thy art, my gentle Shakespeare, must enjoy a part. That is, I have to praise thy art. What does he mean by art? What did, Jim, what did Ben Johnson or Jim Bonson, whichever you want, I was talking about portmanteau words in my class yesterday, my brain or mouth, one of the two, moves faster than the other. What did Ben Johnson call his book? The Works. By art, he means work. Thy art, my gentle Shakespeare, must enjoy a part. For though the poet's matter, that is the stuff that he writes of, nature be, his art, his work, his technique, his skill, doth give the fashion, that is, the clothing. Or to use terms that I've used before, Nature is the substance, and art provides the accidents, okay, of it. And that he who casts to write a living line must sweat. Notice, not he who casts to write a line. He who casts to write a living line, a line that has breath, that has life to it, that's active, must do what? Sweat, such as thine are, that is, your lines are living, and strike the second heat upon the muse's anvil. And then he gives us another image. Turn the same, and himself with it, that he thinks to frame. So the image striking the anvil, it's metallurgy. It's smithing. Why do you strike an anvil if you're a blacksmith? You don't strike just the anvil. You have a piece of metal on that anvil. What are you doing? You're shaping it. You're giving form to it. You're removing material. What do you do when you write and revise a paper? Oh. What I didn't do when I was in your shoes, when I didn't revise a paper, I didn't remove the fat, excess words. I didn't sharpen, I didn't focus, I didn't craft the line. But he says Shakespeare did. Or for the laurel he may gain a scorn, for a good poet, I love this line, for a good poet's made as well as born. Was Michael Jordan born with a basketball in his hand? No. What did he have to do to become the great? He had to practice. He had the raw what? Talent. Talent's the ability. But it has to be what? It's got to be channeled. It's got to be focused. It's got to be trained. It has to be honed. Such wert thou. Now, the anti Stratfordians, they don't like these lines because they imply what? That Johnson knows Shakespeare's writing practice. They imply Johnson knows Shakespeare was not like Samuel Johnson. Anybody know? Maybe he had an 18th century course. 
Samuel Johnson's one of these absolutely disgusting writers who can write stuff first draft. He wrote Razzlus. A little, it's kind of a short story poem. He wrote Razzlus to help pay for it, I think it was his mother's funeral. And he was sitting there writing it, according to Boswell, his biographer, as the printer's boy is banging on his door for pages. And so he's writing it and has his secretary hand the paper to the boy so that it can be taken off to the printer so they can be setting those pages in type. And he's sitting here writing it and finishing it. Like over, yeah, I think it is over two days, he writes this thing. It's a masterpiece. And he writes it one draft. Or John Milton dictates Paradise Lost to his daughter because he's blind. It's not fair. Exactly right. Okay. We're out of time. We will pick up with, and we don't have much, the father's face on 907 on Thursday. And we'll do, we won't do all those things by time, but we'll try to get as much as we can.